Good evening. I'm Graham Dozier, Publications Managing Editor here at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, and I'm pleased to welcome you to tonight's lecture. We wish to acknowledge the generosity of former trustee Ann Worrell, who endowed this lecture and series in honor of our former president and CEO, Dr. Charles Bryan. Now, before I introduce the program, I want to let you know about some upcoming events. Our next lecture will take place online only at noon next Thursday, September 21st. Viola Mueller of the University of Bonn will discuss her new book, Escape to the City, Fugitive Slaves in the Antebellum South, and she's going to focus on her research on Richmond. From October 6th to October 8th, we'll be hosting History Blooms in partnership with the Garden Club of Virginia. We will be highlighting history and horticulture with floral recreations representing the landscapes of the Commonwealth. So visit our website uh, to see the range of workshops, talks, displays, and other opportunities that will be available over that weekend. And for our members on October 9th at 10 a.m., we will be hosting Curator Conversations, an online presentation in which Elizabeth Klasinski, who joined our curatorial team recently, will explore the history of slavery in Virginia through the lens of emotions featuring the voices of both slaveholders and the enslaved as they navigated their complex world. Now, <clears throat> before I introduce the, the lecture itself, I just want to remind you, turn off any of those mobile electronic devices that you may have. John Randolph of Roanoke was a relentless defender of slave, of, <clears throat> excuse me, of the slave state's rights so when upon his deathbed he declared that he wanted to free the people he enslaved, his contemporaries were taken by surprise. But Randolph had left inconsistent written wills and his heirs exploited his lifetime of eccentric behavior to argue that none of his wills was valid because he'd been of unsound mind. The resulting litigation took 12 years and provides a vivid insight into antebellum Virginia life and how the courts dealt with issues concerning slavery. Here to tell us about this fascinating story is Gregory May. He is a historian specializing in the early American Republic and a good friend and regular patron of the VMHC's research library. Greg graduated from William and Mary and Harvard Law School, clerked for Justice Lewis Powell of the US Supreme Court, and then practiced law for 30 years. His first book, Jefferson's treasure explored the life of Albert Gallatin, a Swiss immigrant who served as Jefferson's treasury secretary. Greg's most recent book, A Madman's Will, John Randolph, 400 Slaves, and the Mirage of Freedom, was published this past spring and is the subject of this evening's lecture. So please join me in welcoming our friend, Gregory May. Thank you, Graham. It's a privilege to be here at the Virginia Historical Society to speak, just as it's always a privilege to be here to do research. The collections at the Virginia Historical Society, as most of you know, are absolutely indispensable. And uh, in fact, the frontest piece of my book is this image, which is in the uh, Society's collections. And um, is, I think, one of the few uh, solo portraits of an enslaved man in Virginia that's uh, in existence. This was Juba, one of the two uh, principal enslaved manservants of John Reno of Verona. <clears throat> On a July morning in 1846, whoops, on a July morning in 1846, this large group of enslaved black people climbed the steep hill from the Ohio uh, steamboat landing in Cincinnati into the heart of the city. From a distance, they looked like one of the slave coffles, 
that people in that free city were used to seeing across the river in Kentucky. <clears throat> but the men wore no chains. There were too many small children. And once the whole group came into sight, they filled half a city block. This group of 400, nearly 400 enslaved people was the largest group, formerly enslaved people, was the largest group of African Americans that anyone in that booming free city had ever seen. A madman's will explains how these people came to be free. It uses their exceptional story to open a window into a past that we often see just through the wavy glass. It looks at family feuds, honor, the role of women, the meaning of madness, slavery and racial prejudice, the law, and the operation of the courts. It is, as one of my early readers told me, a book about everything. So there are many things in the book that we can't talk about tonight, but I'll try to give you the essence of the story. The story begins at the deathbed of the man who had once enslaved the people who came to Cincinnati, a Virginia congressman named John Randolph of Roanoke. Everyone in the United States knew who he was, and the newspapers were full of the news when he died. In fact, the newspapers had been full of the news about John Randolph for 30 years. From the time he went to Congress the year before Jefferson's election until the year he died in Andrew Jackson's administration, Randolph had courted fame. His extravagant speeches, savage wit, and eccentric manners grabbed public attention. And even after his death, the newspapers kept rerunning his most famous sayings and doings under the headline, Randolphiana. His appearance alone was enough to set him apart. He was tall and exceptionally thin, with fine russet brown hair, dark eyes, and fair cheeks. He had a high-pitched, almost musical voice, and his words flowed in elegant, seemingly effortless phrases. When he was a boy, people thought he was beautiful. But, but as he grew older, and he's 30 years old in this portrait, his fair cheeks remained beardless. His voice did not change, and there were insinuations about his manhood. Perhaps in response, he developed a haughty, almost feisty cruelness. He called it his spice of the devil, and objects of his withering sarcasm never doubted that he did have an uncanny power to scorch. What made John Randolph most famous was his outspoken, sometimes hysterical, resistance to central government. He had broken with Thomas Jefferson because he thought Jefferson was flexing federal power. And when Jefferson's followers began to consolidate federal power even more aggressively after the War of 1812, Randolph became a voice crying in the political wilderness. It was not until northern Jeffersonians tried to prevent Missouri from joining the Union as a slave state in 1819 that more and more Southerners came around to Randolph's point of view. And in Congress, he never missed an opportunity to remind the Southern members that almost any exercise of political power was a potential threat to slaveholders. So the people who read the reports of Randolph's death in the spring of 1833 were surprised to see rumors that he had freed all of his slaves on his deathbed. That was completely amazing. Randolph had spent a lifetime expanding the large tobacco plantation he inherited from his grandfather. And at the time he died, he enslaved about 240 people. Only half a dozen other Virginians held that many slaves. Only a few hundred planters in the New Cotton South had more than that. And almost no one in America had ever freed so many. But as the months passed and no one offered Randolph's will for probate, it became clear that something must be awry. The problem was that Randolph's last written will did not free his slaves, and a deathbed declaration could not change a written will. 
The last written will left substantially all of Randolph's estate <clears throat> to the first child of his favorite niece, the two-year-old boy whom Randolph had never met. And it also required his executors to sell all but a hundred of his slaves. So they would march off in chains to join the thousands of other Virginians who were being shipped south to meet the harsh labor demands of the cotton boom. Randall's will made no one happy. The five relatives who stood to inherit his estate, including his favorite niece, thought Randolph should just have divided his property among them. They thought the land and slaves would sell for enough to leave each of them about $50,000, which was a very substantial sum at the time. Whether or not Randolph had really intended to free the people he enslaved was no particular concern of theirs. <clears throat> Randolph's close friend and executor, a Virginia, a Virginia judge named William Lee, was unhappy with Randolph's will for a different reason. He had been with Randolph on the night he wrote the will, and Lee thought that the man had been insane. He believed that Randolph, when lucid, had meant to free his slaves, and he knew that Randolph's earlier will had done that. But Judge Lee discovered that he was going to have a difficult time presenting the earlier will as Randolph's last intentions, not because it freed the slaves, but because it left the bulk of Randolph's large estate to Lee. It was not natural, that was the word that people use, for a man to leave his ancestral property to someone outside the family. Families naturally tried to invalidate a will which did that. And the best way to invalidate a will was to claim that the man who made it was mad. That's what John Randolph's family decided to do. <clears throat> and their claim seemed particularly promising because Randolph had left them a lot to work with. Randolph's sanity has been a focus of fascination for more than two centuries. His contemporaries wondered about it throughout his lifetime and historians have questioned it ever since. The stories about his peculiarity are legion his extravagant and wandering speeches, his erratic religious fervor, his bitter antipathies, his flashes of violence, his talks with the devil, there's no end to them. Perhaps one of his cousins gave the best short assessment when she testified that Randolph was at all times very eccentric and at sometimes insane. Nobody doubted that a man had the right to free his slaves. That wasn't the problem. Virginia law had been clear since the revolution. A slaveholder could manumit the people he enslaved as long as he supported those who were too young or too old to support themselves. A manumission would not even have to increase the number of free blacks in the state because Virginia law required everyone manumitted after 1806 to go elsewhere. Local officials sometimes did not enforce that law and some freedmen even got legal permission to remain. But there was no chance that would happen with a large group. The Randolph slaves would have to go. Still, a manumission as large as Randolph's troubled white Virginians. It was more than the gesture of gratitude that occasionally led slaveholders to freeze a few favored household servants. It also did not come from deep religious conviction because despite his occasional bursts of religious enthusiasm, Randolph was never a devout man. And it was just as difficult to cast the decision as the act of what whites like to call a good master. Randolph wanted people to see the manumission in that way. He had always stood on his honor, and his older brother had freed more than 100 of the family slaves when he died decades earlier. Yet even Randolph's friends never saw him as a good patriarch. He had always been too self-absorbed, <clears throat> too calculating, and by the end, just too mean. So the best white Virginians could say for him was that he had been misguided, lost in the revolutionary fantasies of his youth or the religious fears of his old age. 
That would not be enough, however, to prove Randolph insane. A free adult white man who had neither wife nor children could do what he pleased with his property. And the Virginia courts routinely upheld manumissions without questioning the dead man's motives. So what Randolph's relatives tried to show was that his unjustified antipathies towards certain people, including certain family members, proved that he had lost control of his rational mind. It was a fairly typical line of argument in probate cases, still is for that matter, a legal formula that allows disappointed heirs to express the disappointment they quite naturally feel when a rich relative doesn't like them well enough to leave them his money. The result in Randolph's case was two celebrity trials in the capital in Richmond. They had the special attractions that can make some trials sensational even today. In the first place, <clears throat> there was Randolph's lifetime of outrageous behavior. Everyone who had ever known him could tell a good story about it. Then there was fascination with other people's money, especially the remaining property of an old landed gentry that was already fading away. And finally, there was scandal. Some of Randolph's friends said that his madness began when his beautiful fiance rejected him, raising painful questions about his virility. Others expected to reopen claims that Randolph's older brother had only freed his slaves after he was discovered in an affair with his wife's sister. In 1845, after 12 years of litigation, repeated appeals, and a third trial, the will in which John Randolph freed the slaves <clears throat> with, uh, on his plantation finally went to a Virginia jury. The testimony of Randolph's best friend, Judge Lee, probably determined the outcome. Lee had renounced his own interest under the earlier will so that he could testify for the slaves' freedom. And that honorable <clears throat> unselfishness gave him enormous credibility. As the jury heard him describe two pivotal scenes in the story, they could almost see them. In the first scene, a painfully thin old man leans toward his fire on the winter's evening with his will in his hand as his best friend begs him not to burn it. Perhaps one of the man's enslaved manservants stands frozen in the next room listening through the door. Why not just cancel the will by cutting out the signature, the friend asks. In fact, <clears throat> why not just wait a while before doing anything at all? You know what my feeling toward my slaves have been, the old man replies, but they're all changed. He takes out scissors and cuts. Then it's July, 18 months later. <coughs> the dead man's friend now sits with the man's brother, in the shaded room of a village tavern. They're sifting through the crumpled clothes in the man's trunk in search of his will. And they find the cut papers. The brother sees that they disinherit his whole family. The friend sees that they leave the man's estate to him. He stares at the wall. And then he tells the brother that he will release the estate to the family if the family will release the slaves. Judge Lee's renunciation of his inheritance let the jury find a <clears throat> Solomonic solution. It allowed them to free Randolph's slaves without disinheriting his family. They found that the papers Judge Lee had rescued from the flames were John Randolph's last true will and testament. And Judge Lee then persuaded the family that they should pay $30,000 from the estate, nearly four times what the will had provided, <clears throat> to resettle the enslaved people to Ohio. <clears throat> it can unsettle us not to know what the men and women ran up and slaves thought about the 12 years they spent in bondage while his heirs contested the will. No evidence about their thoughts survives. 
So the best we can do is to look at the evidence left by others. And it happens that one of the surviving slave narratives comes from a Virginian named Peter Randolph, whose freedom depended on the trial of another contested will. Peter Randolph grew up on a large plantation not far from John Randolph's place. He was 19 years old in 1844 when Carter Edlow died, leaving a will that freed him and 72 other people on the plantation. In the book Randolph later wrote about his life in slavery, he remembered with indignation that no one even told Edlow's slaves about the will. Randolph found out about it only because he had somehow learned how to read. He and the others had to wait more than three years for a court to enforce the will. Peter Randolph's account of slavery in Southside Virginia is fresh and unsparing. He describes deficient diets, hard labor, and harsh floggings. He names the dishonest lawyer who cheated him and the others during the court battle over the will. But his account says nothing in particular about the years he had to labor while that battle continued. That wait for justice, at least as Peter Randolph chose to tell the story, was just another horror of life in bondage. Ohio lives in American memory as a free state where the victims of slavery could find refuge. The mighty stream that separates Ohio from the slave states becomes the River Jordan. And Harriet Beecher Stowe's depiction of Eliza Harris crossing that river on broken ice in Uncle Tom's cabin is one of the most indel <coughs> indelible images in American literature. Ohio, in fact, does have a proud anti-slavery heritage, but history is always naughtier than it seems. So to understand Ohio as Judge Lee encountered it when he went looking for land for the Randolph Freedmen, we need to set aside our preconceptions. Race and slavery played an outsized role in Ohio life. It could hardly have been otherwise. Ohio had extensive connections with the slave states on its borders and vital economic ties to rich plantation markets down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. The resulting concerns about race and slavery cut in different directions. Fugitive slaves made it impossible for the people living along the Ohio River to close their eyes to the humanitarian horrors of slavery and refugees bound for safer places like New York and Canada got assistance from good people throughout the state. Yet most whites stoutly resisted black settlement in Ohio. <clears throat> Many of them claimed that they too had come to Ohio to escape slavery, which subordinated ordinary whites to large slaveholders. And they conflated the presence of slavery's victims with the evils of the institution itself. Others, including many foreign immigrants in the larger cities, simply resented black competition for menial work. And even in Northeastern Ohio, the so-called Western Reserve of Connecticut, where anti-slavery settlers from New England predominated, there were almost no black settlers. Ohio law had discriminated against blacks in a code called the Black Laws to discourage them from settling there. And th those laws tightened after Virginia, which lay just across the Ohio River in those days, began requiring newly emancipated slaves to leave the state. The Black Laws made it illegal for anyone of African descent to settle in Ohio unless two Ohio landowners posted a $500 bond for his support. Few free blacks could satisfy that requirement. $500 was more than the cost of most Ohio farms at the time. And even a landowner who could afford to give such a large bond almost surely would not do it for a black stranger. But in fact, the local Ohio authorities rarely enforced the bond requirements so that by 1830, blacks represented slightly more than 
of Ohio's population. And the black population was edging toward 2% by the time Judge Lee came looking for land in 1846. The black laws did, however, allow whites to underpay black workers, deny them public relief, and banish them whenever local prejudice required it. Despite the prejudice in Ohio, Judge Lee still believed it was the most promising place <clears throat> to settle the people freed by John Randolph's will. Randolph had asked him not to send them to the free black colony in Liberia. And most blacks themselves rejected the idea of African colonization if, if anyone bothered to ask them. A few emancipated Virginians had gone to Pennsylvania but land there was much more expensive than in the new states above the Ohio River. And Ohio seemed more attractive at the time than Indiana, Illinois, or Iowa. Their black laws were even more stringent than Ohio's. And within a few years, all three of them excluded black immigrants altogether. Lee found a particularly promising place in Mercer County which sits at the midpoint of Ohio's western border. About 100 black families had already settled several thousand acres there around a village called Carthagena. The community was thriving. They had built mills, schools, shops, and meeting houses. And a Quaker abolitionist from Connecticut had established the manual labor college just outside the village. All of that seemed to indicate that whites were willing to accept black settlers there. And Quaker involvement promised continuing support from a people who had a strong historic anti-slavery commitment. So in the spring of 1846, Judge Lee began to assemble about 3,000 acres in the area. News of Lee's land purchases provoked a backlash. Members of Ohio's Whig Party favored repeal of the black laws. So this large influx of black settlers, which was going to more than double the black population of Mercer County, was just what the Ohio Democrats needed to swing racial prejudice against the Whigs in the upcoming autumn elections. Just days after the news of Lee's land purchases showed up in the newspapers, a Democrat in the legislature asked for a study into the exclusion of all emancipated slaves. As we have no particip participation in slavery, he said, we ought not to be subject to its evils. A prominent Whig member <clears throat> begged to remind him that Ohio had agreed to many of the evils of slavery when it joined the Union. The Constitution gave men the right to enslave other people, he said, and it gave free people the right to go wherever they pleased. The Ohio House nevertheless voted to consider the exclusion, and the Senate agreed by the overwhelming vote of 26 to 6. The backlash in Mercer County was more violent. On the morning when three canal boats from Cincinnati brought the Virginia settlers to a canal port there, <clears throat> a place called New Bremen, uh, a mob of white farmers promptly surrounded them. The mob demanded that all 383 of them post the $500 bond required by law or immediately leave the state. They set an armed guard overnight, and the next morning they crowded the settlers back onto two boats bound for Cincinnati. Men with bayonets walked beside the boats on the towpath of the canal until they had crossed the county line. It was a hard case, wrote the local newspaper, to turn away 80 families of black slaves worn out by laboring to build up princely fortunes for their taskmasters. But it was a harder case, said the newspaper, to make Mercer County's white farmers live among Negroes fresh from Virginia. If the freedmen were allowed to stay, said the paper, Farmers would not even be able to move away because no one would buy their land. Newspapers in other places, however, 
sharply reminded the whites in Mercer County that they had managed to take a great deal of the freedmen's money for land before coming to that conclusion. The banished Virginia settlers camped about 30 miles south for several months while they looked for new homes and work. Farmers in the surrounding counties eventually hired them for the season on the understanding that Judge Lee would resettle them the following year. Most white Ohioans simply hoped that they would go away to Liberia after all. Mercer County's expulsion of the black settlers became national news. Newspapers from New York to Mississippi ran the story alongside reports of the Mexican War that had broken out just a few months earlier. The Mexican War, of course, renewed strong sectional controversy over the expansion of slavery. And that controversy gave this story of racial exclusion in Ohio a special resonance. <clears throat> the different spins that the newspapers put on the story map antebellum America's dilemma over race and slavery. The Ohio papers claimed that Virginia slaveholders had no business sending poor black people into a free state where they would just depress wages and reduce property values. From their safe distance in New York, the major anti-slavery newspapers dismissed those concerns. They said free blacks had as much right to settle Ohio as anyone else, and they bewailed the Ohio mob's demonstration of bitter racial prejudice. The Southern newspapers just took the chance to sneer at the Northern critics of slavery who recoiled at the very idea of accepting black neighbors. The best known of Randolph's freedmen decided to return to Virginia. John White had been John Randolph's principal manservant for years, along with Juba, so he had seen a great deal of the world. He had been jailed, beaten, and abused, but he had never before been discarded. Virginia law said that emancipated slaves who returned to the state would be whipped and sold back into slavery. <clears throat> but White calculated that his advanced age and his association with John Randolph would see him through, and he was right. Just a few years later, John White and his family appear in the records of his home county as free persons with legal <clears throat> permission to remain there. The Randolph Friedman story took on a troubling meaning after the Civil War. The Reconstruction Congress considered giving millions of emancipated slaves enough land to support themselves. The proverbial 40 acres and a mule that described what the ordinary white farmer in Ohio needed to make a living. But the congressman from Mercer County said <clears throat> that the fate of John Randolph's freedmen there proved that such reparations would just be pointless. Randolph's freedmen had received some of the best land in the whole country, he claimed, but they had lost it because they were just too lazy to work. It. White's retold that tale for generations. It conflated the Randolph freedmen's attempted settlement with the earlier farming community in Carthagena, and it concealed the white violence that ultimately had driven nearly all of the black settlers from that part of Ohio. The 20th century writer James Baldwin once described the difference <clears throat> between a tale and a story. A tale, he wrote, aims to prove something, and we know what the tale means because it has a moral. A story, on the other hand, is more like real life. It's full of ambiguities, and it leaves us with lots of questions. What a story means, he said, depends on what we make of the questions with which the story leaves us. The same can be said of history. If we want to draw lessons from the past, we can shape it into a good tale. But if we want to learn from the past, we have to accept what we find there and then think, dare I say critically, 
about how it affects the world we live in today. Raise your hand if you have any questions and we'll bring a mic to you. So what came of the slaves? They were, as I mentioned, scattered through the county south of Mercer County, Shelby and Miami counties. And <clears throat> They formed several small communities there um, at places called Rossville, primarily three, Rossville, uh, Hanktown, and um, Riley. But <clears throat> over time, um, they were gradually sort of forced into urban areas. And most of the descendants who remained in that part of Ohio uh, became residents of uh, Troy, Pequa, in the larger cities in that part of Ohio. Um, in the early 20th century, <clears throat> they began to have reunions. Um, and in 1907, the survivors and the descendants of the others brought a lawsuit <clears throat> in Mercer County to recover the lost land, which resulted in another 10 years of litigation uh, another wonderful judicial record that provided evidence for the work I was doing, um, and ultimately, of course, in no recovery of the land after the case had gone to the Ohio Supreme Court. Where did the other freed slaves uh, typically in Ohio, and any other cases like the ones uh, Mandolph's uh, freed slaves? Well, ma manumitted slaves from Virginia <clears throat> most commonly did go to Ohio because for the same reason the Randolph slaves did. Uh, it was <clears throat> nearby, an adjacent state. Um, it had excellent land. The land was still cheap. And discrimination, although severe, uh, was less sharp than in most other states. Um, the other common, uh, most common destination for Virginia uh, freed slaves was Pennsylvania. But um, communities, as far as I know, did not go there. They were, tended to be small singles or families um, that would go to Pennsylvania, usually by special arrangement <clears throat> with um, white families in Pennsylvania who took them on as farm workers or servants. Um, now, enslaved people in Virginia who escaped uh, usually had different destinations. Since they were subject to recovery through the federal fugitive slave laws, they needed to uh, hide themselves in cities and get further away. So they would more likely go to uh, Massachusetts, to Boston, to New York, and to Canada, uh, which was the only safe place for uh, an escaped refugee. I'm curious if um, there are any parallels between the um, challenges made to John Randolph's will with an earlier instance of a massive manumission of enslaved people by Robert Carter III um, in the 1790s, I believe it was, mm -hmm. and, and he freed over, I think it was 450 of his enslaved people and family similarly mm -hmm. contested his plan. Were there any precedents set in that Carter case that came into play in settling Randolph's case? Good, good question. And let me back up um, by talking just a bit about other large manumissions. Um, <clears throat> in addition to Robert Carter's manumission, which he did during his lifetime, 
and therefore he was able to block his children from uh, contesting it until after he had died and many of his slaves were already free. Um, although they did contest further eman emancipations after he died. But in, in addition to Robert Carter, uh, there were large eman uh, emancipations by, for example, George Washington, who freed the slaves that he owned individually when he died. He couldn't free the Custis slaves that belonged to his wife and her heirs. Um, uh, by John Randolph's brother, Richard, who freed about 110 slaves in his will also in the 1790s. Um, his widow executed that will, forced John Randolph of Roanoke to help her execute it. Um, and there's a magnificent book about the community formed by those uh, freed people in Prince Edward County, just outside of Farmville at a place called Israel Hill, a book by uh, Professor Ely at William and Mary called uh, uh, Israel on the Appomattox. Uh, so there's a, <clears throat> there's a long history of um, large, although uncommon, manumissions like this in Virginia. Um, stopping a manumission legally uh, was difficult unless you could show that the men, uh, and they generally were men, of course, uh, who freed the slaves had been mentally incompetent to uh, emancipate them because the legal right to free slaves was pretty much unquestioned. And the Virginia Court of Appeals regularly upheld uh, manumissions when they were challenged. Uh, how extensive was your research into the lives of the freed slaves? I'd be interested in if any of them uh, ever uh, in the Civil War may have served in the uh, U.S. colored troops. Mm -hmm. um, several did. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the, the book talks about that. Um, ironically, perhaps, uh, some of them were at Petersburg when it fell uh, and led to the, the uh, collapse in Richmond and the surrender at Appomattox. Um, and I say ironically because <clears throat> they were besieging the very city where a Virginia jury had finally given their ancestors, given some of them, freedom. Uh, because the, the third trial, Arano's will, was at the courthouse in Petersburg. Um, after Randolph's uh, property was all divided, was the uh, did they still grow um, tobacco there? And if so, did they get slaves again to do that? What happened to the property? Uh, they sold the property. <clears throat> the, the heirs were, um, uh, except for one, um, not planters themselves, really. Um, <clears throat> and so their interest in the property was uh, simply monetary. Yes. Um, if John Randolph wanted to free his slaves, why didn't he do it while he was alive? Well, that 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 of course um, is a is a good question that sheds light on his real motivations, doesn't it? I mean, most Southern slaveholders did not free their slaves during their lifetime. That was quite unusual. Uh, almost all significant manumissions were done by will after death. Um, manumissions were not an act of unselfishness. Manumissions were a way for slaveholders to proclaim who they thought they were, to, they were, they were more interested in what their world or their God might think of them than in what might happen to the in people they had enslaved. Um, have there been any research into John Randolph, the man himself? He seemed to have been a pretty eccentric character. Um, I was wondering about maybe genetic issues with his um, 
you know, he looked a lot like a woman. Um, was have any work been done on that? There, there are many <clears throat> excellent biographies around him. He was a very important uh, political figure <clears throat> in the antebellum period, and he is very important to historians who study that period of American history. Um, so yes, there there has been a lot written about him, uh, a lot of good biographical work. Um, there has been um, since about the 1960s a lot of speculation about his physical condition uh, and his mental condition. And um, I, I call it speculation because really at this remove in time, it can't be more than that. Um, and as you perhaps have heard, um, one historian, and this has been repeated by others since then, has made the provocative suggestion that Randolph might have had Kleinfelder's disease which is a genetic disorder that leaves males with an extra um, X chromosome. But, you know, th that's merely at this point a matter of speculation. Was there a period of time in Virginia history where it was against the law for a man to free his slaves? Yes. Um, <clears throat> it was, um, th there was no legal bar to manumission until, and I've forgotten the exact date, it was sometime in the early 18th century uh, when Virginia was still a colony. And, that, and then it was illegal to free enslaved people in Virginia from then until 1782 after the revolution, when uh, primarily the Quakers in Virginia prompted the legislature <clears throat> to change the law to allow manumissions. Uh, the Quakers wanted to rid themselves of the taint of slavery, and they made um, the, what the legislature thought was a sensible point, that a man ought to have the right to do with his property what he wanted. Um, but <clears throat> by 1806, um, the whites in Virginia who objected to the presence of free blacks were able to get the legislature to pass that additional law I made reference to, which required all newly emancipated slaves to leave the state. And that was a drag on additional emancipations, not that there weren't some, but um, slaveholders and indeed the enslaved themselves hesitated at that point because although many of them in fact remained, there was a possibility of banishment. Um, and that made emancipation look a less attractive alternative to everyone. Was uh, George Lee rich? And uh, do we know anything else about him? Judge Lee? Correct. Um, <clears throat> Judge Lee was not an extremely wealthy man, no, and that's one reason that his renunciation of his interest under the earlier will um, gave him so much credibility because he clearly was sacrificing a lot. Um, and, and the book talks about the public perception of that uh, and his, uh, his relationship with the then uh, Episcopal Bishop of Virginia, William Meade, uh, who was a um, co-trustee under Randall's will for the uh, enslaved people who were supposed to be free. And Meade uh, was, the other co-trustee was Francis Scott Key, who was a very close friend of John Randall. Thank you. Uh, I went to school in Marietta, Ohio, which was the first American settlement in the Northwest Territory. I'm a little confused that how there was a legal argument there because my understanding is part of the um, argument that the founders of Marietta and the Northwest Territory uh, was that it would be a free, it would be free of slavery. So why was there any basis for a legal argument to prevent um, 
freed slaves from settling in Ohio? Well, <clears throat> let me begin by questioning your first premise. Okay. Uh, yes, Ohio was supposed to be a free state, and the Ohio Constitution said that. But in fact, many of the earlier settlers in Ohio, uh, <clears throat> not so much in the Northeast, but in the rest of the state, came from Virginia and Kentucky. And they often brought their previously enslaved people with them as uh, indentured servants. So that there was, in fact, uh, some slavery in Ohio in the early days. Um, that, of course, doesn't go to the real question here, which is why was there so much prejudice in Ohio against emancipated or manumitted uh, people who came there? And um, although Ohio was a free state, there was certainly nothing uh, in its constitution to prevent the enactment of those black laws which aim to exclude settlement by free black people. Um, so although, um, as I said uh, in the talk, there is this sort of historical understanding that Ohio was a free refuge for previously enslaved people, it, it's not that simple. How did you stumble upon this subject or uh, connect with this thread in history? Um, I first stumbled on this, this subject um, as an undergraduate <clears throat> when I was reading um, what is still the most comprehensive biography of Randolph, written in 1922 by William Cavill Bruce. And he has a chapter in there on Randolph's will. And I thought it was absolutely amazing that you know, this sort of unusual and interesting event didn't seem to be getting attention uh, since then or anywhere else. In fact, there was only one journal article about it uh, that really had ever been written uh, on into the last part of the 20th century. So I sort of filed that away as an interesting, very interesting uh, subject that um, deserved more exploration. And then when, now almost 20 years ago, uh, Professor Ely wrote Israel on the Appomattox, and it got a lot of attention, um, I, I realized that there would be an audience for this story. Uh, assuming that he was not a mad man, uh, what is your best understanding or best guess as to what prompted him to manumit the, his slaves? Was it the, uh, the the more selfish act that you were describing? Was that the the, the best possibility? Uh, or uh, was it because he had no real direct descendants? Or what is your best thought of why he, why he did it? Well, <clears throat> first, uh, I, I should say that I think there's no doubt that, that Randolph was mad. Um, I mean, like, like most people who suffer um, with mental illness, he had different phases and he was in different conditions throughout his life. But um, <clears throat> that, that became an issue only because his heirs wanted to contest his will. I don't think it really had anything to do with his decision to free his enslaved people. Um, why did he free them? It's complicated, and he never said. So we can only intuit. And despite having spent years reading all his papers and thinking about it and so on, I wouldn't pretend to be able to give an easy answer to it. He grew up in a family um, where there was much discussion about slavery. His uh, stepfather, St. George Tucker, <clears throat> was um, the proponent of probably the only really coherent plan for emancipation in Virginia that was ever um, considered by the legislature, except that it wasn't considered. <laughs> it was merely transmitted to the legislature and tabled. Uh, but Tucker, who was a law professor as well as a judge, continued to publish the plan in the book that he used for his students. So um, 
there was that influence. There was John Randolph's uh, older brother's influence. His brother um, was a very complicated character, and so characterizing his motives is probably just as hard as characterizing Randolph's motives. But that uh, admired older brother's example certainly had some influence on Randolph. Um, there was Randolph's own feeling, I think, that slavery was wrong, uh, which didn't necessarily mean that he was going to free his slaves. But when his um, brother's sons died and he had no obvious male heirs, um, he was sort of the classic uh, example of the kind of person who would free their slaves during this period, a childless son of the revolution. Um, who was John Randolph's grandfather and what's the Randolph's family relation to the other prominent families of Virginia at that time? Uh, John Randolph's grandfather was Richard Randolph of Curls, and he was one of the many sons of the man who's generally um, remembered as William Randolph of Turkey Island, who was sort of the founder of the family in Virginia. Um, and yes, most Virginia Randolphs are descended from uh, William Randolph of Turkey Island. Richard Randolph, by the way, was probably the wealthiest of William Randolph's sons. So where where was this John Randolph's place? Uh, Charlotte County. Charlotte County with what towns or villages? Uh, well, if you've been to Charlotte County, you know, <laughs> you may know the answer to that question. Uh, Charlotte County is to this day a very lovely rural place. And uh, Randolph's place was uh, in the southern part of the county, uh, on the, the Roanoke River. Um, and uh, the, the nearest uh, community or uh, village or whatever it should be called is Saks, or there's a place there now called Randolph, um, which is not really a village. Um, this is all about, uh, gosh, I'm forgetting now, but maybe, maybe 10 miles south of Charlotte Courthouse. Greg, I'm going to ask the last question. We've seen you in the library recently doing a lot of work. What are you working on next? Uh, I'm working on another manumission. Um, the the, the uh, project that I'm working on is tentatively uh, entitled The Bloody Birth of Freedom, John Brown, Robert E. Lee, and the Liberation of George Washington's Slaves. And it looks at Robert E. Lee's uh, execution of his father-in-law's will in which his father-in-law, who was George Washington's grandson and adopted son, freed the slaves he had inherited from George Washington and their descendants. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Greg will be up in the lobby shortly if you'd love to get a book signed. <laughs>